Well, good morning. So here we are, and it's Easter Sunday. We're celebrating all the wonder of the truth that Jesus is alive and the goodness of all that that means to us. But even as we do this, sometimes it feels a bit confusing. How do we navigate the reality that we still live in a world where there is so much pain and so much fear and so much loss? How do we celebrate the truth that Jesus is alive and has overcome death and darkness in a world where we so often still feel very afraid? And spaces where disappointment seems to be so close to our hearts and our minds and our experience. Well, to understand this morning really well, we need to put it in a larger context of what's going on in the context of this passage. Again, we remember at Christmas time that God didn't leave us on our own to try and navigate all that was broken and damaged and wrong in our souls or in the world around us, but God chose to come near. Born as a baby, fully human while remaining fully and completely God, God with us. And he lived and experienced all the fullness of what it meant to be a part of a human existence, all the pain and all the joy and all the disappointment and all the relationships with their highs and lows and their ups and downs. He revealed to us more of the character of the Father and explained to us how we live in the kingdom of God and continue to journey with him. And then on Good Friday that we celebrated just a couple of days ago, we remember that Jesus suffered and he died. The one who had never done anything wrong took the full weight of all of my sin and all of your sin so that if we choose to, we can live life always in relationship with God, experiencing forgiveness and grace and mercy and acceptance. But the interesting thing is that on Good Friday, when Jesus was accomplishing this tremendous victory over all kinds of darkness and making a way for us to come to God, it would have looked to all of his followers like he had failed. Almost everyone that day assumed that Jesus had failed, that this was some kind of disappointment. It would have looked to all of them like evil and darkness and death and difficulty and pain are so much stronger than hope and joy and peace and life. It must have seemed to the disciples that all of their very worst fears were coming true. But in the silence of Easter morning, Jesus came back to life never ever to die again, gloriously raised back. And in that space, it proclaimed the wonderful truth that Jesus is glorious. It was the definitive reality that he had overcome all sin and darkness and death, that his sacrifice was acceptable. You see, the resurrection means that death is not the final word on my life or your life or any of our lives. Because now if we choose, we can live life in relationship with God for all of this life and the fullness of the life to come. The resurrection means that we don't need to live life alone. Trying to find some way to prove our value and worth by being great or powerful or talented or beautiful or important. The resurrection proclaims to us this amazing good news that we can be adopted, drawn right into the family of God, not based on anything that we have done, but based on what Jesus has already done for us. Welcomed in with an unconditional love to experience life with him now and forever. You see, this is a glorious morning because it proclaims to us this powerful truth that Jesus is alive and because he is alive, everything is different. Because he is alive, he has overcome all that is broken and wrong and twisted and distorted in our world and within our own hearts. But Jesus doesn't want this to simply be a nice idea that we get to hear about once a year on Easter Sunday or maybe occasionally at other times. Jesus wants this to be remarkably personal for each and every one of us. And we see this playing out in the ways that Jesus chooses to interact with his followers after his resurrection. Again, they all still believe that Jesus has died and that he's dead. They don't know that all of this has changed. We see this in the way that Jesus interacted with Mary. Now, Mary is the first person who got to see this really good news that Jesus was alive. And Mary had this interesting story with Jesus. Again, at one time, Mary was overcome by the power of evil. She was living in a dark and a destructive path. But Jesus had found her. Jesus had set her free from all the power of evil. Jesus had given her dignity. He had given her purpose. Jesus had given to Mary a meaningful place within the context of his community. And Mary had laid behind all the rest of her life and chosen to follow Jesus. And on Good Friday, Mary was one of those few people who stood by Jesus. She stood somewhere in the crowd and watched as Jesus suffered and as he died. 
She was there when they took his body down off of the cross as they journeyed towards the tomb, wrapped him up in some kind of linen cloth, and stuck him in the tomb. She saw all of it. Mary knew for sure that Jesus was dead. And on Easter morning, she gathered together a few others to do one last act of kindness and service for Jesus. They're coming to the tomb to just anoint his body, to care for him one last time, to say a final goodbye. But as Mary comes to the tomb, she finds that it's empty, that the body of Jesus is gone. And Mary doesn't know, she can't understand, she doesn't know what has happened. And so we read in John chapter 20, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, Why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. Can you hear the intensity of the grief in Mary's voice? Again, from Mary's perspective, all that she had hoped for, all that she had longed for had just died with Jesus and been placed in the tomb. As she comes to the tomb and finds it empty, the last thing on her mind is resurrection. She knows, and we all know, people don't come back from the dead. So her assumption is that someone has desecrated the tomb. They've taken and stolen his body, and who knows where they've thrown it. And in that moment, Mary is overcome with grief. Everybody else has left, and she stands there outside the tomb, all on her own, weeping. Overcome with the loss of Jesus. Probably profoundly afraid. Because Mary is living in a world where all that she hoped for and all that she longed for and all that she loved, she believes it's all gone and it's all dead. She's living in a world where it looks like evil and darkness will always win and every single little bit of hope gets snuffed out. As she stands there afraid and concerned and grieving, all of these things. And I wonder, have you ever had a moment like that? Have you ever had a moment where you tasted grief like this? Maybe a moment where you looked at the world around you and what you saw was so disappointing and so disillusioning to your heart that you just lost all hope that things could be better. Maybe it was a moment when you lost someone that you loved. And when they died and passed away, you felt like you could never even imagine going on living. Maybe it was a moment when you had to give up a dream where a dream just died and you had to try and process the reality that life now would look remarkably different than all that you hoped for and all that you dreamed about and all that you planned for, that none of this would now take place. As you tried to grieve and unpack all of these things, it just felt like hope dissipated from all of your experience. Maybe it was a moment of profound fear where you looked around at the world around you And it seemed like all that you love is just disappearing. This is how Mary felt in those moments. This is the depths of her grief. There was nothing left to hope for. In the midst of her grief, she looks back once again into the tomb that had been empty, and she sees two angels, one at the head and one at the foot, and they say to her, woman, why are you crying? And somehow she knows and understands she just needs to turn around. And we read, at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Can you imagine that kind of grief? The kind of grief where you could look into a tomb that a moment ago was empty and you look back and you see two angels sitting there and it doesn't even deter you. It doesn't even phase you. And then Mary turns around and Jesus himself is right there, but all that Mary can see is that she's continually consumed with her grief. She can't even imagine the possibility that this could be Jesus. She assumes it's the gardener and maybe he's carried his body away and dumped it somewhere. And so she asks him, Can you tell me where this body is? I will take it and I will look after it. Again, we all recognize the physics of this. There's no way that Mary could have carried the lifeless body of Jesus. But in the depths of her grief, it just doesn't matter. 
She needs to do whatever she possibly can. And I love the tenderness of Jesus in this passage. Jesus is so gentle with Mary. He recognizes the depths of her grief that she is just enwrapped in it. And he doesn't try and shock her out of her grief by revealing the wonder of who he is to her in that moment. He simply asks her a question. He says, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And he gives Mary this moment, this gracious gift of some space to just begin to unpack in the presence of God some of what she has been journeying through and the depth of the loss that she feels. But before she settles into that for too long, we read that Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabioni, which means teacher. All that Jesus had to do was just say her name. Because no one could say her name like Jesus did. And the way that he said her name, she felt known to the very core of her being. He just calls out her name and instantly she turns and she looks up at him and she recognizes this is Jesus, alive and whole and complete right in front of her. And she just grabs onto him and she's holding him for dear life. Because suddenly everything looks remarkably different. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Again, this is just what Jesus is like. Jesus has just overcome darkness and death and all that is broken and wrong in all of the world. This is the greatest victory in all of cosmic history. And you would think that Jesus might have something better to do, but he's uniquely concerned for Mary. After all that he has just overcome, he goes directly to her. Because Jesus recognizes that in the depths of Mary's heart, she is overcome by grief. She is shrouded in loss. She is mourning the intensity of all of this. She is consumed with fear about what the future might possibly look like. And this deep sense of disappointment is settling into the deep places of her soul. And so Jesus chooses to meet with her personally and to reveal to her in a unique way the truth of who he is, the wonder of the reality of his resurrection that changes everything. And we see this such a strong movement on Jesus' heart. In the days to come, not just with Mary, but also with Peter and with Thomas and every one of Jesus' followers, Jesus reveals himself to them and meets with them in a unique way so that each one of them can personally understand the truth of who he is, the wonder of his resurrection, the reality that now everything is different because of what he's accomplished. He is uniquely concerned for each and for every one of them. And we see this even in the way that he talks to Mary. In the moment of Mary's highest delight, she grabs on to Jesus and she holds him. And Jesus takes this moment with her and then says to her, you can't hold me. You've got to go and you've got to tell the others. They have to know, they have to understand that this is what is real and this is what is true. His heart is longing uniquely for each and every one to come to know personally and to understand the reality of what it means that he is alive and he has overcome death and darkness and evil and pain. And today we get to continue this movement. We are here still celebrating the wonder that Jesus is alive and the goodness of all that this means to us. But today, how are you doing? Today, as you sit here and embrace the celebration, how is your heart? And how is your soul? Again, I think for so many of us, we come into a room like this, we come into a day like this, and we feel so much like Mary. What are the losses that are playing out in your soul? The losses of hopes and of dreams, maybe the loss of innocence, the loss of peace, the loss of joy, the loss of relationships. Maybe today as you're here, you're just holding this weight, this grief that life is not the way that it's supposed to be. The pain of some kind of injury or loss or damage that's taken place in your life over the past. And for so many of us, we come into every moment of every day just carrying some kind of weight in our soul because life is painful and it's uncertain. 
and it settles into our guts, and we carry this grief with us. And for so many of us, we are profoundly afraid because we've just heard and we've just seen too many things. We're afraid of death and we're afraid of loss. We're afraid of pain. We're afraid for ourselves and we're afraid for the other people around us. We're afraid of our failures and our mistakes of the past coming back to haunt us. We are afraid of the uncertainty of the present moment. We are terrified of the future and what it might hold. We walk into a moment like this carrying all of these fears and all of this grief. And the really good news of a morning like this is this is exactly the context to which the resurrection came into. This is exactly the space in which Jesus spoke this remarkable truth. He went to Mary uniquely to her and called out her name, inviting her to understand the wonder and the truth that he's alive and that means that he has overcome all that is broken and evil and dark and dislocated and fractured and damaged in her life and her experience and in her world. And today I want you to know that the resurrection means that there is always hope that nothing that you and I have ever or will ever suffer or endure is ever meaningless. Because if God raised Jesus from the dead, he will also one day make all things new and make everything right. Everything will get redeemed and reshaped and formed and moved and refashioned into something beautiful. One day, everything will make sense. And the resurrection tells us that there is always hope. That even when life seems hard, when there's darkness and grief and pain and uncertainty, that the presence of God continues to meet us in those things. And we are confident and sure that one day he will make everything new. That one day it will all radiate with the wonder and the light of his presence. We recognize today that Jesus has remarkably overcome, and he's not just overcome. But today Jesus is uniquely concerned for you. Again, in today, Jesus understands all of the grief. He knows everything about every moment of pain that you have ever endured. Jesus understands all of the fears that gnaw at the inside of your soul and rob you of delight and joy and peace. He understands every single part of it. And he invites us to bring us our despair and our discouragement and the ways that we feel afraid and unsure and to pour out to him all of this grief and all of this uncertainty because we recognize this remarkable truth that even though we can't see it or taste it yet in fullness, Jesus has still conquered. He has still overcome. He has still broken and shattered the power of evil and darkness and death and all of these things that terrify us. And so we can come into his presence for the peace and the joy and the strength and the capacity that we need. And today, if you're here and you don't yet know Jesus, you don't yet have a relationship with God through Christ, I want you to know that Jesus is uniquely concerned for you. That the love of God for you is full and complete. It is unconditional. That Jesus is so passionate about you that he suffered and he died on Good Friday to take the full weight of all of my sin and all of your sin. So that if you choose, you can live life now with him for the fullness of this life and all the uncertainty that we face here and throughout the fullness of all of eternity. You see, Jesus understands all of who we are, all of where we have been and where we are and where we are going. And the resurrection reminds us that his sacrifice was gloriously acceptable to the Father and so we can experience freedom and joy and peace and hope in the presence of God. Jesus is calling your name and inviting you to live life in relationship with him. And the decision to follow Jesus is the most important decision that any of us could ever make. It's not a decision to be made lightly. Again, what we gain in Jesus is so infinitely valuable that we could never, ever pay for it. But in order to be able to receive it fully, we need to give all of ourselves to Jesus to surrender control of our lives to him, to choose to follow him every day in every way that he calls us to move forward. It means that we turn away from the life that we currently live and embrace fully the life that he offers to us. And so we want to take time to consider and process, is this a decision that we want to make? And as we choose him, he gives us this glorious exchange. He takes all of our sin and all of our brokenness and all of our darkness, and he replaces it with his rightness with his wholeness, and with his light. 
And again, if you're exploring this concept, this idea of who is Jesus and do you really want to follow him, I want to, I want to encourage you to continue to engage with us because we have so many great opportunities to get to know more of who Jesus is and to understand more of what it looks like to walk with him and to follow him. But today, if you feel ready, if you've been thinking and processing this and you just know somewhere in your soul that Jesus is the one that you need, I want to encourage you, just pray this prayer with me or something like this in your heart as I pray. Jesus, I want to follow you. I ask for your forgiveness for all that is wrong in my life. I choose to give my life to you. Would you take all of me? Help me to walk with you every day. Amen. And again, if you pray to begin this relationship with Jesus, don't leave this room before you tell somebody else. Again, tell the friend that you came to church with. Tell one of the people who will be here at the front praying after the service. Talk to me. Talk to somebody else before you leave here, just so it can settle more deeply in your soul. There's something that makes everything much more real when we share this kind of news with someone else. And also, if you just began a relationship with Jesus or you're new to this relationship, I want to invite you to a new course that we have beginning next Sunday. It'll take place in the landing just at the back of our building during the 915 service called Walking with Jesus. And it just gives us a chance to understand and to know more about what does it really look like? What does it really mean to follow Jesus and to walk with him and to get to know some other people better who are on this journey as well? Again, today is a really good day. Today is a day where we get to celebrate the wonder that Jesus is victorious, that he has overcome, that he has broken the power of hell and darkness and evil, that he will sovereignly rule and reign in a way that pain and anger and grief will one day be fully done away with. Today we get to celebrate that Jesus is victorious, but not just that he's victorious. We get to also celebrate that he is uniquely concerned for each and every one of us. That he wants to make this good news real to every single one of our hearts. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the amazing tr truth of this day that you are victorious, that you are strong and you are mighty. There is nothing that we need to fear because you have already overcome. And so Jesus, today we want to give to you all of the disappointment that has settled into our souls. Today we offer back to you all of the grief that shrouds us and paralyzes us from being able to receive joy and hope and capacity. Jesus, today we offer to you the fear, the fear that hinders us from being able to step out and to walk with you and to take any kind of risk. We surrender all of these things into your hands. Lord, would you take them? Would you somehow miraculously breathe the truth of your resurrection into our hearts and our minds and our souls and our beings so that we could walk with you faithfully and delight in you always? Today and every day, would the resurrection become real to the core of our being? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.